Uh, let's talk about uh, acids first. All right, so uh, you probably think that when you hear the word acid, you're probably thinking things like uh, uh, hydrochloric acid. And uh, so let's do a little bit of a review, a review here for that. Um, this is back from Chapter 3, so if you've kind of forgotten uh, the Chemistry 170, the first thing I want you to be able to do is, first of all, look at the, uh, look at the substance and... Uh, what type of acid is this? Is this a binary acid or an oxy acid? It's binary. It's two components, hydrogen and another nonmetal. All right. So uh, when we see terminal hydrogens and we see only hydrogen and no oxygens, this is called a binary acid. And um, the other thing that's really important about binary acids are that is that are acids are that um, you need to put this AQ here, aqueous. Make sure you put that because if you just say HCl, uh, if we put it in the gas phase uh, or we don't know what the phase is, we may assume that you're talking about it in terms of a gas and the name of this gas is just hydrogen chloride. So make sure you put the word aqueous to signify that you're working with the acid. So this is crucial for binary acids especially. So uh, how do you name binary acids? This is back from chapter 3. What kind of prefix do you use? Hydro, Hydro is the prefix. And then you take the nonmetal chlorine and then you change the ene on the chlorine to ic. So this is hydrochloric acid. All right. So this only is naming for binary acids. All right. So uh, don't use hydro for all acids. It's only for hydrogen bonded to another element. All right. Um, the other type of acids that we're going to focus on are ones like uh, this one. And so this is not a binary acid. This is an oxy acid. You go, how do you know it's an oxy acid? Well, it has oxygen in it. That's the easy way to know the difference. You have binary acids. You have oxy acids. Oxy means oxygen. All right, to name an oxy acid, you have to know your polyatomic ions from Chemistry 170. So what's the name of that polyatomic ion? Sulfate. So once you know the polyatomic ion, the other thing you have to know about the polyatomic ion is you have to know the charge on the polyatomic ion. This is sulfate negative 2 charge. That tells you how many hydrogens are going to have to be attached to this polyatomic ion to be neutral. So that's how we know it's H2SO4. All right. So the rule for, so this is an oxy acid or sometimes called an oxo acid, either way you want to call it. Um, oxy acid or oxo acid. The way this works is if the um, polyatomic ion ends in 8. The acid ends in ick. All right. So I ate something icky is what we said in chemistry 170. Help us remember that eight ions form ick acids. So this acid is called, you take the name of the polyatomic ion, change the eight to ick. So this is sulfuric acid. All right. So if you're struggling with this, go back to chapter three. Look at the last part of chapter three, which talks about naming. So why is it so important that we can name the acids? Well, you're going to be talking about a lot of different acids in this class, and you're going to have to be able to name them. And again, you'll have to be able to identify them, and the number one indicator that it's an acid is if you see terminal hydrogens. Terminal. Either end, can be on the front end or the back end, but that indicates a, a, an acid. Now, not always. We can have something like this, methane. Methane's got terminal hydrogens, but it's not an acid. All right, so you have to, it is kind of tricky, um, but generally, uh, if you're going to look at an acid like this, it's going to be, uh, if it's a binary acid, the hydrogen will be out in front. If it's an oxy acid, it'll be out in front, or it'll look like this. If I want to write another oxy acid that's written in what we call organic notation, here's one, it looks like that. This is a carboxylic acid, this is acetic acid, all right? So acetic acid, uh, you will see um, 
that the carboxyl group, which is actually this part of it, now let me go in and write this out. So this part here is called the carboxyl group, and it's what gives organic acids a lot of times their, their chemical property of an or, or makes them acidic. All right. So this part translates into that. Um, so this is yeah. Let me write that down. This is the carboxyl group. It comes up. Um, it comes up quite often. Do what? Can't see some. Yeah, acetic acid. Yeah, acetate. You knock the hydrogen off of that, and it's acetate. All right. So it see it works that way, right? Eight ions make ic acids. So you knock the hydrogen off this. This is the acetate ion. Eight ions make ic acids. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's different ways you can write a acetic acid. The other way you could write it is H C two H three O two. And just acetate You might have written it this way. Acetate, you might have written either like this. That's why I didn't write it either way. Yeah, like that. Yeah, that now if you see a person writing acetic acid like this, he's generally an inorganic chemist. That's the way I was actually taught to write it. If you see a person that writes it out like this or knocks this hydrogen off and makes a negative sign, uh, that's somebody that's kind of based on the organic method. Now, the organic one is gaining acceptance because uh, it's easier. It, it almost gives you a structural form. It gives you a better idea of what, this, what the substance looks like. All right? All right, let's go on to the next slide. So here is the first crucial step to chemistry, uh, or chapter 15. You have to memorize, and you have to do this, you have to memorize the six strong acids in water. All right? Three of them are binary. They are hydrochloric, don't forget the aqueous, hydrobromic, and hydroiodic. So there's three binary acids. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic. Then there's three strong oxy acids in water. First one is sulfuric acid. This is car battery acid. Now, a lot of times with the oxy acids, you will not see aqueous. Technically, you should put aqueous with these, but because they can't be interpreted as a gas or a liquid, uh, we generally don't. You see the aqueous left off a lot of times. Uh, another very strong uh, oxy acid is nitric acid. And how this is working, this is the nitrate ion. Eight ions make ic acids. And then the last of the strong acids in water uh, is HClO4. This is perchloric acid. Remember the perchlorate ion, and uh, this is perchloric acid. Now, you probably never work with perchloric acid. It's pretty strong oxidizing acid. It can, it's easily to mix with things and form explosives, like you can mix this with uh, sugar even, and it can make an explosive uh, compound. So uh, you probably work with a little nitric in the lab. It's a strong oxidizing acid. That's why we like it. It can, it can actually you know, uh, eat up copper. You can pour some on some copper. It'll react with it, whereas hydrochloric won't do that. So that, sometimes we do result to using nitric acid. Nitric acid is one of those acids I use to test to see if you what you know how pure your gold is in your jewelry. They can take a little bit off your ring. They take a little file and scrape off some uh, pieces of it. They add nitric acid and it starts to give off a gas or it starts to change color. Then they know you've got some other base metals in there besides gold. So these are the strong acids, and you have to memorize these. And the, what you do is you memorize these six. You assume all other acids are weak in water. All right? So memorize these six. Assume everything else, like acetic acid, ascorbic acid, uh, which is your component in vitamin C or in fruit. Um, uh, those are all weak acids, yeah. Let's see, what's another weak acid? Hydrofluoric acid. This is when it throws most people. Hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. It's not a strong acid. All right? Uh, so what makes it a strong acid? Well, we got to define what an acid is. I mean, all I've said is it's got terminal hydrogens on it, but there must be a theory that defines acids. 
There's actually three uh, theories. There's Arrhenius' theory. He was the first one to come up with uh, a theory for acids. And he's the person who, Savante Arrhenius was the person who determined that sodium chloride was actually sodium ions and chloride ions back in the 1800s. So, um, he, so he, he was big into ions, so this is what he said. He said if you take a substance like HCl and you add it to water and you get hydrogen ions and chloride ions, that's an acid. So he said that anything that contains the hydrogen ion in it or generates the hydrogen ion is an acid. And uh, he, so that's how he defined an acid. He actually defined a base, which will be coming up. He defined a base the same kind of way. You take something like sodium hydroxide, you put it in water, and you get sodium ions and uh, hydroxide ions. Again, two ions are formed. These are aqueous. Um, that means dissolved in water. So um, that's how he defined a base. Anything that generates the hydroxide ion, anything that has the hydroxide ion in it is considered an Arrhenius base. Well, the problem with uh, Arrhenius' theory doesn't work. Uh, it, it's, not very, it's not very good for something like ammonia. You look at ammonia, and you might look at it and say, if you had to guess, what do you think it is, an acid or a base? It is a base, but I mean, you don't see you see these high, you don't see hydroxide ions attached to it. So Arrhenius would be kind of saying, well, I know it's basic based on the properties that I visually can uh, see, but I don't see any hydroxide here. So when we put ammonia in water, this is what happens: hydrogen from the water, hydrogen ion from the water attaches itself to the ammonia, and we get the ammonium ion. And then what's left over of the water? Hydroxide ion. So now we've generated hydroxide ion. We have a base. And that's what makes ammonia a basic solution. It's not present initially in the substance. But when reacted with water, uh, we form ammonium ions and hydroxide ions. So we get a basic solution. So to explain this with a new theory or a better theory, uh, we have the Bronsted-Lowry definition. And I'm assuming this book uses Bron. So, uh, the uh, previous book that we used, they threw out Lowry for some reason. They just said it was the Bronsted definition. But this one's gone back to this. All right, so the Bronsted-Lowry definition. This is what the... So, Arrhenius definition, you got to keep these definitions straight. Arrhenius definition's got to have hydrogen ions, got to have hydroxide ions. And so these are all considered Arrhenius acids here. Bronsted-Lowry definition, he, they worked with aqueous solutions. So they wanted a different way to explain uh, an acid and a base. So Bronsted-Lowry looks at this ammonia reacting with water, and this is what it says. Anything that is a proton acceptor is a base. Anything that's a proton acceptor is a base. Anything that is a proton donor is an acid. So in this reaction, water is acting as the acid and ammonia is acting as a base. Because ammonia accepts the hydrogen ion from the water. So now we're going to be talking about acid-base pairs. If you're talking about Bronsted-Lowry definition, you're going to have an acid and you're going to have a base within the chemical reaction. So once the ammonia accepts the hydrogen ion and becomes the ammonium ion, we've got a name for that. That is called the conjugate acid. Whatever adds a hydrogen ion to, whatever accepts the hydrogen ion, that new substance is called the conjugate acid. And whatever's left over of the substance that lost the hydrogen ion, like the uh, water lost the hydrogen ion, what we have left over is the hydroxide ion. This is called the conjugate base. Conjugate base.
All right, so let's look at an example of what we can do here. You have HCl. You add that to water. Now notice water is not a bystander like in the Arrhenius definition. We put water up here with the chemical yield sign. And the Bronsted-Lowry, you're going to write HCl plus H2O. And then you're going to say, okay, if this is the acid, it's going to donate a hydrogen ion to the water. And that's going to form H3O positive, which is called the hydronium ion. You need to know the name of this ion. This one comes up all the time. Hydronium. The hydronium ion is what gives an acid its chemical properties. The H3O positive ion. What's left over of the hydrogen chloride? Yeah, Cl negative. All right. So this hydronium ion is the conjugate acid, and the chloride ion is the conjugate base. So you take the substance, when you strip a hydrogen ion off of it, whatever's left over is the conjugate base. If you take a substance and you add a hydrogen ion to it, that substance is called a conjugate acid now. All right? And so both with Arrhenius and the Bronsted-Lowry definitions, the definition of a strong acid is it's, it's acids that go 100% to completion, or pretty close to, 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 three, to um, three significant figures. They go 100% to the right to the product. All right? So strong acids, these six in water, when you place them in water, they go 100% ionized to a hydrogen ion and the conjugate base. Let's do another one. Let's look at the, um, this is the one that throws people the most. H2SO4, strong acid. Uh, so we're going to do it like the Bronsted-Lowry definition. We're going to add that to water. The sulfuric acid donates a hydrogen ion to the water. And we're left with um, H3O positive plus HSO4 negative. Now, I know, I see a lot of times students do this. They go something like, uh, let, let me do it the Arrhenius definition because that gives it, it's shorter. They'll just say H2SO4 yields two hydrogen ions plus the sulfate ion. Well, it doesn't lose both of the hydrogen ions completely. It doesn't do that. If you look at the Bronsted-Lowry definition, it, it, there is a second reaction here. The hydrogen sulfate ion can react with water and form H3O positive plus the sulfate ion. Yes, that does happen. But what makes sulfuric acid is a strong acid is the K, the equilibrium constant for this reaction, not the equilibrium constant for this one. The Ka, which that's what we call these, acid ionization constants. Okay, so let's talk about that. Here is chapter 14. We are talking about equilibrium constants in chapter 15. In chapter 14, we talked about Kc, that was an equilibrium constant, uh, constant concentration. We talked about Kp, which is an equilibrium constant related to pressure. Now we have another equilibrium constant, Ka, called the acid ionization constant. And it is an equilibrium constant, but when we hear Ka, we know we're talking specifically about an acid. So the Ka for this reaction is greater than 1. That's what makes it a strong acid. Remember that if K is greater than 1, that means the products are favored over the reactants. Actually, the Ka for this acid is going to be much, much greater than 1. That's what this means. Double, double um, greater than signs means much, much greater. So we'd expect this maybe to be 1 times 10 to the 40th power or something like that. Because this reaction is going 100% to completion. This one goes 100%. This reaction, though, doesn't go 100%. And that's why it's not really correct to say H2SO4 completely breaks apart into two hydrogen ions and a sulfate ion. Uh, the Ka for this is going to be less than 1. The reactants are favored over the product. Because the Ka is less than 1, we call this substance here a weak acid. 
So that's how we define it mathematically. Anything with a Ka much greater than 1 or greater than 1, we usually call that a strong acid. If Ka is less than 1, it's a weak acid. Now, I think what makes this confusing is, is that if you do add, so like if you're in the lab and you're going to titrate sulfuric acid with sodium hydroxide, Yes, the hydroxide ions will strip all the hydrogens off of the sulfate, and we get water plus a salt, Na2SO4 aqueous. So, yeah, when you put a strong acid in the presence of a strong base, yes, all the hydrogens will come off of the sulfuric acid and form a salt over here. But just in water alone, and I should have AQs here, uh, this reaction does not go 100% to completion. All right, so we talked about the Arrhenius definition, Bronsted-Lowry, you have to identify. What I want you to do with the Bronsted-Lowry, I want you to be able to write me an equation like this. I want you to be able to identify the species, that this is the acid, this is the base, this is the conjugate acid, and this is the conjugate base. All right? I want you to be able to identify what is likely to be an acid and what is likely to be a base like so. If you see positive ions like this, that's an indication that substance is acidic because it could lose a hydrogen ion and leave yourself with the hydrogen ion that lives in ammonia. So positive ions with terminal hydrogens generally indicate that substance is acidic. When you see things like this, negative ions, and the, uh, you add a hydrogen ion to that, you would get neutral, you get HNO2. That indicates this substance is a base. So negative ions tend to be bases. Positive ions tend to be acids. That's important to know. Yeah. So are all conjugate acids and conjugate bases considered amphoteric? No, because, uh, yeah, let's talk about amphoteric here. All right, so he's brought up the term amphoteric. Um, or another thing that is called is amphoprotic. All right, so what does this mean? It means that that substance can act as both an acid and a base. So um, if we look at uh, water, we've already seen this example. When we take ammonia and we add it to water and we get the ammonium ion plus the hydroxide ion, in this case, water is acting as what? An acid. Because it's donating a proton to the ammonia to form the ammonium ion. So in this case, water is acting as an acid. But if I add hydrochloride, hydrogen chloride to water, uh, I, get, uh, I get H3O positive plus Cl negative, the chloride ion, negative chloride ion. So what's water acting as here? Base. It's accepting a hydrogen ion. So that's what we mean by amphoteric or amphoprotic, that the substance can act as both an acid or a base. Like amphibian, land or water, ampho, amphoteric uh, can accept or, or donate hydrogen ions. That's why we say a lot of times amphoprotic. Now, so the question is, what about the chloride ion? Can the chloride ion accept a hydrogen ion and form uh, hydrochloric acid. What do you guys think? Okay, what you have to do is you have to look at the hydrochloric acid. Strong acid or weak acid? Strong acid. So what's the definition of a strong acid? It goes 100% this way, right? 100% this way. The reverse. So it can't go chloride ion reacts with hydrogen ion finds hydrochloric acid, which is a good thing because if you were sprinkling salt in your soup and the chloride ion from table salt could react with the water in it uh, to form uh, hydrochloric acid, it would be, it'd be a problem, right? So that's something, so here, here, so what are we getting at here? It's this. Here's your strong acids again. Uh, and we said that these strong acids go 100% uh, to their ions. Uh, so the reverse does not happen. 
The reverse does not happen for these. So uh, what, what's nice about this, you know that the chloride ion will not react with water and form uh, hydrochloric acid. You know the hydrogen sulfate ion will not react with water and form sulfuric acid. It's not going to happen. So the, the strong, here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the statement you need to know. The stronger the base, the weaker the conjugate, I mean, the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. The stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate, the weaker the conjugate base. The stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. So, hydrochloric acid being a strong acid, its conjugate base will not accept a hydrogen ion from water and find, form hydrochloric acid. That's not going to happen. The hydrogen sulfate ion is not going to accept the hydrogen ion from water and form sulfuric acid. Because these are the conjugate bases of these strong acids. Now, you take something like, um, uh, you take something like ammonia. Ammonia, when we add it to water, we've seen this one already, we get ammonium ion plus the hydroxide ion. So in this case, ammonia is acting as a base, water is acting as an acid. But if we put ammonia with something like the hydroxide ion, we can get NH2, the amide ion, plus uh, H2O. So water is, I mean, ammonia is amphoteric. It can act as both a acid and a base. So the two most common amphoteric or amphoteric substances that you're going to deal with, especially in chemistry 180, is ammonia and water. Ammonia and water. There are other substances. If you take organic chemistry, well, you're going to talk about it's a different thing, really. Actually, when you take organic chemistry, you probably you're not going to you might use the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid, but there's another theory for acids and bases towards the end of the chapter called the Lewis theory of acids and bases. Lewis theory because when you're working with organic substances, you usually are working in non-aqueous systems. You're not working with water because uh, organic substances, a lot of them are nonpolar. They don't dissolve in water. It's like oil and water. Organic oil with water don't mix. So a lot of times in organic chemistry, you're working with strictly non-aqueous systems, and that's got a different. There's a different theory to explain acids and bases in um, Lewis theory. Lewis theory says that uh, a um, let's see, an acid. Let me, uh, let me think about it here a second. An acid is a proton, uh, uh, an electron pair acceptor. Is that right? I'm not an organic chemist. That's why I've got to look myself. Electron pair acceptor, I believe. Let's make sure we're right. We want to teach you something wrong here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. Yeah. All right. Um, so definitely know this statement. The stronger the acid, the weaker the, the conjugate base. One other thing you need to know about acids and bases. If you don't have a clue, let's say your law, you haven't memorized your acids or anything like this. When you see hydrogen attached to a non-metal other than carbon, when you see hydrogen attached to a non-metal other than carbon or silicon maybe, a lot of those are going to be considered acidic. I mean like H2O we saw was amphoteric. Uh, HF is definitely an acid. So that's one way you can determine that you're dealing with an acid. The other thing it tells you that you're dealing with an acid is if you look at something like sulfuric acid, if you do a Lewis structure for sulfuric acid, it looks like this. 
Yeah, let me, let me, one other thing on that. Let me make sure we get up that All right. So um, they have a table of these on um, uh, page 657. I want to see. All right. So let me. I guess I'm going to have to figure it out myself here. All right. So let's see. Let's see if this is the right Lewis structure. So remember Lewis structures from. Uh, chemistry 170. Let's add up our total number of valence electrons. We got two for the two hydrogens. We got, uh, we've got, I need to put something here, uh, six, 667, 667. All right, so let me see if I'm doing, I may not be actually doing this one right. Let's see. Um, so we got two valence electrons for the hydrogen. We got two oxygens. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six, and we got two, so that's 12. And how many does, uh, oops, well, we got four of them now. We have four times six, 24. All right. And then uh, how many for sulfur? Six. So we're dealing with 32 electrons. Let's see if I've got 32 in here. Eight here, eight here, eight here, and eight here. So we could write it this way. It's legal. Uh, we could also write it with the hydrogens attached to these oxygens. But either way, what I'm trying to get at is this. When you get a non-metal hydroxide, that is almost always an acid, a non-metal hydroxide. So if you don't know if it's an acid or not, look at what it looks like. Non-metal hydroxides, that's the way we say it sometimes, non-metal hydroxides are acids. What happens is these electrons get pulled in towards the center. They create a, an electron cloud around this part, and it pulls the electrons off of the hydrogens which makes the hydrogen break off as an acidic hydrogen. Your book talks about this towards the end of the chapter, and we'll come back to it, but since we're just starting this chapter, what I want you to get out of it is that if you get lost, at least look at it and say, hydrogen with the nonmetal, I have to guess it's probably an acid, especially if it's a terminal hydrogen. If I see a nonmetal with a hydroxide ion, again, this is going to generally be a polyatomic ion with a Hydrogens and oxygens, nonmetal hydroxides, also acids. All right? So acids must be different than bases, otherwise we wouldn't have the classification. So let's talk about the properties. Acids are sour. Think about vinegar, lemon juice. Acids, acids turn uh, blue litmus, which is a vegetable dye. Uh, you take acid, you put it on blue litmus, and it, and it turns blue litmus red. So that tells you it's an acid. Um, acids react with metals a lot of times and generate hydrogen gas. Maybe you did that. I think you did that in the lab in chemistry 170. You added acids to different types of metals like magnesium, form some hydrogen gas that way. Um, acids work uh, react with carbonates, CO3 two negative carbonates, and form carbon dioxide. Acids are corrosive. It's corrosive. You add them to metal. That that really comes back to it's an oxid. It, it generally oxidizes metals. That's what we're talking about. Corrosive. Um, it'll eat metals up. All right. Sour. Turn blue litmus red. Changes. It reacts with some metals and forms hydrogen gas and reacts with carbonates to form carbon dioxide. Uh, let's see. Well, since we're talking about that, let's look at let's look at bases. Let's go on and define bases since we've done that. So, bases are bitter to taste. Oops. Bitter. So acids are sour. Bases are bitter. So where do you taste bitterness? Well, the probably most common thing is the salad that you're eating. Most plant materials are bitter. If you'll look at even drugs like cocaine, it comes from Plants, plants generally are bitter. They're bitter like that as a self-defense mechanism so we don't eat them. So they generally generate some kind of bitterness so we're not likely to eat it. So what do you do with the salad? You put salad dressing on it, which has vinegar in it because you like, m most people like the taste of something sour versus bitter. Um, if you get into food science, you start manipulating all this stuff like this. It's about how much... Moisture's in the food. People don't like real dry food. They like a little moisture in it. They like it a little sour versus bitter. 
Uh, coffee is, even though coffee is acidic, it does have bitter components in it. That's why it's taste, you know, coffee tastes a little bitter. Or real dark chocolate, which is a plant extracted material. Again, a bitter substance. So you can have bitterness embedded in something acidic, but in general, bases are going to be bitter. Um, again, like you eat spinach, you put vinegar maybe sometimes on your spinach or something like that to counterbalance that. Uh, let's see. Bases, are they, they can be corrosive, but the thing that really stands out is they're caustic. That's what makes it a little bit different than acids. Bases are caustic, which means that when you get them on your skin, it starts changing the fat underneath the skin into soap. So they feel slippery. If you've ever had any easy off on you, or maybe you've gotten some sodium hydroxide on your hands in the lab and you notice it feels slippery, right then you're causing a chemical reaction between the hydroxide in the base and the fat underneath the skin, and it's making a soap out of your skin. So you want to make lye soap, take a bunch of animal fat, pour some sodium hydroxide on it, heat it up, and you've seen this maybe at some of these, um, uh, I don't know, I see it at these fairs sometimes in the fall uh, where somebody's making uh, soap out of some kind of fat. Or maybe you've seen, what was the movie, uh, Fight Club? Yeah, you take animal, I mean uh, human fat, right? And they make soap out of it. So um, uh, they, caustic means it reacts with biological tissue. That's what it means. This is why we're always concerned when you're in the lab, you wear your goggles at all times because I, I, of all the things in the lab I'm most afraid of, when we're working with sodium hydroxide, that's when I get, I'm a little bit more tense that day because sodium hydroxide, you're working with one molar sodium hydroxide. If you get it in your eyes, you've got about 30 seconds before you lose your cornea. It'll eat the cornea. It, it reacts with biological tissue. It gets on the cornea, and your cornea is pretty, it's, it's got a lot of water in it. That's the way the cornea stays alive. It's a really neat tissue on the body, right? So you get this in your eyes, you've got about 30 seconds. Well, a lot of times when a student gets this in the eye, by the time I would even know anything about it, it's too late. But if you get something like sodium hydroxide in your eyes, immediately run to the eye wash station and start washing your eyes out, you know, where the paddle is. That's what that's there for. I've never seen a... I've never seen a case of it in lab, but you read about it. We get these reports every once in a while what kind of uh, problems are happening in labs. And so this one does happen. Um, the other place you see this happen a lot, there's about 2,000 cases a year, is where you guys are, you've got a stopped up drain at home, and you pour uh, Drano down the drain, and uh, you don't, it says to put two teaspoons in it. You guys pour about a half can because you say it's really... It's really clogged and I'm going to really hit it hard and it, what it does is it goes down into the trap and it forms a plug and sodium hydroxide when it reacts with that little bit of water that's in the trap actually gets hot enough to boil. You ever feel the, uh, the tube, the trap itself, it gets hot. It can melt the plastic. I mean I've heard of people damaging their plastic plumbing by adding too much sodium hydroxide. So they hear the fizzing while they do, they look down the drain and bam, it shoots up out of that drain and gets them in the eye. And then they go running around the house saying, I've got this stuff in my eye. And by the time they get to the hospital, they, it's too late. They've lost their corneas. So you'll notice on the newer bottles, and the, it's really been like this maybe the last five to 10 years, they say that when you put the Drano into the drain, you're supposed to put an inverted bowl over. The only reason why that's there is for legal, it's a legal thing, right? If you didn't, all I have to say now is you didn't follow instructions. We told you to put an inverted bowl over that. Nobody does it, but that's what it's there for, to say that you didn't follow instructions, so we're not liable. But, it, I mean, sodium hydroxide is, power, I mean, the sodium hydroxide you have uh, in, the, in, in your Drano is the same sodium hydroxide we use in the lab. So it's a pretty common uh, I mean, well, 2,000 is not real common, but I mean, 2,000 people a year, a few. Out of 2 million, 240 million, maybe not, but it does happen. All right, so uh, bitters, uh, so the uh, bases turn uh, red litmus. Now, that's the acidified litmus. So we've taken the vegetable dye and we've acidified it, so it turned red. So bases turn red litmus back to blue. Okay. 
So what are the definitions of a base? Again, Arrhenius' definition says it has the hydroxide in it. This is the Arrhenius definition. The so it, it generates the hydroxide ion. The bronsted lowry we've already seen it. It's when uh, the substance is a proton acceptor or a hydrogen ion. Either way you want to say it. If you take a hydrogen ion, remember it's got one proton, one electron, a hydrogen atom. So if we take this one electron away, what we have left is a proton. So we call them proton acceptors or hydrogen ion acceptors. What are the strong bases? The strong bases... It's a little bit, there's a little bit of controversy on strong bases. Now, anything out of, any metal hydroxide out of group one is a strong base. There's no controversy with that. All metal hydroxides out of group one or 1A if you're using the old naming system, group one or group 1A, verse vertical columns, those are all strong bases. Sodium hydroxide, which is called Li, potassium hydroxide, which is called um, uh, potash, or, um, yeah, potash, that's another name for it. Uh, and then we have uh, the, the other ones you're probably not going to see. Rubidium, cesium, francium. Francium's radioactive. Cesium doesn't have, you're not, we don't have any rubidium or cesium compounds. So these are the most two common strong bases out of group one. Out of group two is where you'll get a little bit of controversy as to what are the strong bases. And I haven't, since I haven't taught out of this book, I mean, I know that this one, everybody says this one's a strong base out of group two. All right? Then, depending on the book, uh, calcium hydroxide may be strong, may not be. And I don't know what this, this book, this one particularly says. So, right now, we'll just stick with barium hydroxide. When we get to the base chapter, then we'll, we'll see which ones they could. What happens is, the reason why there's this controversy is that Barium hydroxide strong base, because think about it. If this goes 100%, it doesn't go to 100% completion, but we assume it does uh, most of the time when we do calculations. We get two hydroxides for every one mole of this. But with calcium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, some people will say it's a strong base because it, it is pretty strong. But it doesn't go 100% to completion, and it doesn't dissolve very well in water. It generally settles out in the bottom of a, of a if you have it even in a one molar, Concentration, it's usually settling out. Yeah. Um, what is the or the, the litmus start as for the acids? It starts out as blue as the acids. Did I say that or did I say red? I think you said it turns to blue. Yeah, it turns to blue. Oh, wait. But then let's, you have the bases also turn to blue. No, yeah. Let's see. Turns blue litmus red. Is, right. Yeah, all right. Yeah, turns blue litmus red. So blue litmus is the vegetable dye, and it's blue. And when you add acid to it, it, it turns red. So then, when we say that bases turn red litmus blue, you've taken acidified litmus, and now you're adding base to it. All right? All right. So let's see. Let's, let's move on, then. Any questions on acids and bases? That's what you have to know. Categorization. What's the difference between acid and base? Theories that drive an acid and base, Arrhenius definition, Bronsted Lowry definition. Be able to do examples of both and then identify. Can you just go briefly? Would you say, like, on the reactive side, if they have a hydrogen, they're a base? Right. Okay, but on the other side of the conjugate, it's the opposite. Well, once that, accept, once that base accepts a hydrogen ion, it's now considered a conjugate acid. So let's, yeah, let's draw it again here. Well, let's just look at this one again. So here, this is our nice classic one for the Arrhenius definition. So again, what's happening here is um, this is the base because it accepts a hydrogen ion. And when it does that, it becomes, oops, I wrote this wrong. Yep. Can't have two positives. You know, here's something that you can always check. You can never have in a chemical reaction more positives or negatives on one side versus the other side. Like if it's neutral on this side, it has to be neutral on this side. So if you got a positive ion over here, you better have a negative ion over here to balance it out. You can't have two positives over here. All right, so the ammonia gains the uh, uh, hydrogen ion, becomes the ammonium ion. Remember that name, ammonium. That's one of your polyatomics from 
chem 170. The ammonium ion is the conjugate acid. So if you take any substance and you add a hydrogen ion to it, it's now a conjugate acid. All right? And then uh, what's left over, so this was the acid, water was the acid over here. When you strip a hydrogen ion off something, what's left of that substance is called a conjugate base. So a conjugate acid base would be on the product side of the reaction. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So you're going to have to see, yeah, a, a, a proton transfer or a hydrogen ion transfer, yeah. All right, other questions? All right, so huh? we will towards the end. They don't really bring it up till that towards the end of it. I, I don't know if we, I probably will talk a little bit about it just because the quiz will probably have, they could have a Lewis one on there. How many people is planning to take organic chemistry? Yeah, we better do it. So you'll get more of it in organic. I mean, we just touch on it here, and then you're not going to hear again to organic. But we'll be taking organic in the fall or the summer, so you do need to know the definition. Other questions? All right, so let's talk about pH. So we've defined what an acid is. We talked about the theories that define it. We talked we talk about partly what a base is. We'll do a little bit more of base. At least we talked about... The two theories that define a base, Arrhenius's and Bronsted-Lowry, we talked about the properties of a base. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start the process of defining pH. And that's what the rest of the lecture is going to be on. So the first thing about pH is you have to know this equation. Water does react with itself. Water reacts with itself. One water molecule transfers a, a hydrogen ion to the other water molecule. And that water molecule then becomes the hydronium ion, H3O positive, aqueous. And what's left over of the other water molecule? The hydroxide ion, aqueous. So over here, we're assuming this is a pure liquid and this is a pure liquid. Pure H2O. You saw that on the, uh, the Master in Chemistry with that water, uh, the water gas equation. We take water and react it with carbon graphite. The carbon graphite was a pure solid. Liquid, the water was a liquid. So those weren't in the expression. The expression just had the hydrogen and the carbon monoxide. Same thing here. So write the equilibrium expression for this reaction. So you should get K... Now let's write, let's do this. Let's put it right here in the middle. K, equilibrium constant, equals the concentration of the products over the reactants, but the reactants are pure liquid, so they're integrated into the constant itself. Yeah. Per person. In situation 1B, I mean, if it was just reactants, it would still, like, it would still be that expression 1. It wouldn't be one over. Yeah, it would. It would be one yeah. Over. If you flip this reaction, because look, that's the tool we learned, right? If this reaction went in reverse, no, I mean, it's like, it'd be one over. Say the two reactants were both opposite and the two products were both liquid. Both liquid. Yeah. yeah, you would have. There's no product you can write in your. You'd have one over that. Oh. Yeah, you would have one over it. I mean, really, it is the reverse of that reaction, right? Yeah, so you would have, if this is K going in the forward direction, in the reverse direction would be 1 over K. Yeah. All right. Now, this particular equilibrium constant is so important. Um, it's got, it, we put a little W down here. So, like I said, all we're talking about in the next three chat, 14, 15, 16, is equilibrium constant. KC, KP, KA, acid ionization constant. Here's the next one. KW, ion product constant for water. Ion product constant for water. So you do need to know the terminology because sometimes they ask specifically for this. And if you don't know that KW, which is an equilibrium constant, is this particular one, then you make a mistake. So make sure you know the term. All right, so... What we find out is in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius, 
How much of this do you think is actually converted to hydronium ion and hydroxide ion? Very little, right? Because if it converted very much, you'd have maybe a sour taste to the water or some basic taste. You'd have these things reacting with your tongue, right, as you drink it. So in, at 25 degrees, the concentration of this substance, the hydronium ion in water, is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar, moles per liter, all right? So what does the concentration of the hydroxide ion have to be? Same thing, right? For every one of these, it's converted over. One of these is formed and one of these is formed. So this is also 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. All right? This reaction has a name, and you need to know this name. It's called the auto-ionization of water. So know that term, auto-ionization of water. This is the foundation of, of pH right here, auto-ionization of water. So what does Kw have to equal at 25 degrees Celsius? Yeah, so that's multiply together, what is that? Yeah, negative 14, little math quiz here. You remember you add the exponents when you multiply them. So Kw is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. So you're going to use this uh, to, do, let's say you know what the uh, hydroxide ion concentration is. Let's say uh, this is, uh, uh, let's say this is 0 0.10 molar for the hydroxide ion concentration. You're going to use this equation to then determine what the hydronium ion concentration would be. So what would the hydronium ion concentration be? So what is it, Josh? You ought to be able to look at that and tell me. If you're solving for this, what is it? What's the value for that? No. Negative 13 is right. All right, so H3O positive is equal to this divided by that. So 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, the, the ion product constant of water. This, is, you just say 1 times 10 to the negative 1. That's the easy way to do it. And you subtract your exponent, so that's going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 13th molar. Now, don't forget this M is molar, moles per liter. It's not just moles, it's molar, M moles per liter. Now, so, huh? So here's the question. Would you consider this solution acidic or basic? Which one's present in a greater quantity, hydroxide or the hydro or hydronium ion? The hydroxide is greatest. 1 times 10 to the negative 1 versus 1 times 10 to the negative 13. The hydroxide ion is of greatest concentration. So this solution is highly basic. Very strong basic solution. Do what? All right. So this is what we know. If, if the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion are both 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar, what do we call that type of solution? Neutral. All right. Since Kw is fixed, we always have to come back to that value there. We can do like we just, we just did here. We, we changed this one to 1 times 10 to the negative 1. Let me erase this. Let's erase this part so I've got some room. All right. So let's say this is the hydroxide ion concentration and this is the hydronium ion concentration. So if the hydroxide is 1 times 10 to the negative 1, this has to be 1 times 10 to the negative 13th, so that when I multiply these two numbers together, I get the ion product constant for water. All right? If the hydronium ion is 1 times 10 to the negative 4th, what does the hydroxide ion have to be? That's right. 1 times 10 to the negative 10. Is that acidic or basic solution? Acidic because the hydronium ion concentration is greater than the hydroxide ion concentration. 
So anything that has a hydronium ion concentration greater than 1 times 10 to the negative 7th is considered an acidic solution. We're not saying acid or base here. We're just describing the solution. It's acidic. You can make acidic solutions with both acid and bases. It depends on the acid and base itself. But acidic solutions are solutions that have a hydro hydronium ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative 7th or greater. Do what? Yeah, this is that we're going to get into pH from this. That's right. No, it's greater. One times ten to the negative fourth is a larger number than one times ten to the negative seventh, right? Right. So yeah, so pH. So if the hydronium ion concentration is greater than one times ten to the negative seventh, we're getting less negative exponents, then it's acidic. If it's less than one times ten to the negative seventh, you've got a basic solution. All right, so here's the one that throws people. What if I said the hydronium ion concentration was uh, 2.3 times 10 to the negative 6? What is the hydroxide ion concentration? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I can't just look at that. I have to get the calculator out. And that's what I find is if I keep doing the ones that's just based on factors of 10, everybody gets those. But when I put in something like this one, 2.3 times 10 to the negative 6 for the hydronium ion concentration, then students start going, I don't know how you figure that one out. You do it the same way so that you're really going to have to get the calculator out though, right? You're going to have to take the ion product constant of water, divide it by 2.3 times 10 to the negative 6, and that will give you the hydroxide ion concentration. What's that equal? We need one more significant figure. Four point what? Three? Huh? Four point three? Times ten to the what? Minus ten? Minus nine. All right. You're not getting that? Yeah, I don't know if it's 4.0. I wouldn't. I don't know. So that's that's how you figure it out, though, right? That's how you figure it out. You, you're going to use. So here's the first equation you're going to have to memorize. This one right here, the ion product constant of water, which is equal to one times ten to the negative fourteen, is equal to the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. Now I will also say this. A lot of times when this equation is written out. It'll just be Kw equals the hydrogen ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. They don't technically use the hydronium all the time. Um, these mean the same thing. They're the same thing. It's just that this is easier to write here, so we like this one better. They are the same thing. The hydrogen ion attaches to the water and the Bronsted Lowry definition. It makes a hydronium. If you want to talk about it in terms of Arrhenius, you could do that, but we use these interchangeably to make it easier to write. All right, so neutral, uh, let's do this again. I'm going to use the hydrogen ion this time and the hydroxide ion. Uh, concentration has got to be in moles per liter. Uh, neutral, this is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. This is 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. Uh, 1 times 10 to the negative uh, 8 molar for the hydrogen ion means that the hydroxide ion has to be what? Negative 6. All right. So uh, if we got 1 times 10 to the negative 2 molar, which is a larger number than 1 times 10 to the negative 7, so we got acidic solution, what does the hydroxide have to be? 1 times 10 to the negative 12. All right. So acidic this way. Basic this way. If you're right around that, you're neutral. Now, nobody likes working with, huh? Yeah, nobody likes working with exponents. Who likes writing that all out and who likes speaking? I've got a uh, hydrogen ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative 7. In fact, when you get outside of this classroom, how many people do you know knows enough chemistry to know what 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar hydronium ion means? 
So when especially like if you work for the pool service, you, you they don't you you don't want to talk to a customer in terms of molarities and uh, and hydronium ion concentration. You're going to sit there and say your pH is out of whack in your pool. We're here to fix it. So what's pH? So pH is this. P is a shorthand word. It's one letter notation for a chemist to mean negative log. H means the hydrogen ion concentration. So pH equals the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So here's another equation we need to know. pH equals negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So we're going to focus on what's to the left of the line here. And you're going to take the negative log of these three numbers and tell me what you get for pH value. So you can do this in your head. This one's easy. What's the negative log of 1? 0. Log of 1 is 0. All right? You need to know that. Okay? The logarithm is the inverse of an exponent. So what the logarithm does is it pulls the exponent back down into the base. So when you take the log of 10 raised to the negative 2, what do you get? You get negative 2, but we put a correction factor, factor in here of a negative. So negative log of 10 raised to the negative 2 makes this a pH of 2. We don't like negative numbers. Nobody does. We like a positive scale. So we put the little correction factor of a negative there with the log to make them all positive. So what's neutral become? 7, negative log of, a, of a, the hydrogen ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the negative 7 is 7. And um, what's uh, this last one? 8. So pH is above 8. As pH increases, we're getting more and more basic. So hear that because I, I find this is what students mess up on. If pH increases, we are saying that it's getting more basic, not acidic. pH goes from 7 to 8 to 9 to 10 to 11 to 12 to 13 to 14. pH is increasing its basic. As pH decreases, we're getting more acidic. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. As it decreases, more acidic. Um, so that's a lot easier to talk to people about. pH of 2. Let's say your pool's at a pH of 2. Would you want to go swimming in it? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, it'd be highly irritating. Uh, so here's the next thing. pH of coffee. If you drink coffee, pH is around 4. How many times more acidic is coffee than water? How much, Frank? Well, how many, okay, so how many pH units difference are there between coffee and water? Three. And each one of those changes in one pH unit represents how, uh, what amount? A power of what? Of 10. So coffee's a thousand times more acidic than the water you're drinking. Fruit juice is the same way. So the epidemic that they believe we'll see in the next, in your generation, is that when you get it to be 70 years old, your teeth are going to be eaten off because of all the acidic stuff that we're drinking, like fruit juices and pop. So would calcium and hydroxide really get based? Is that like the nicotine powder in the gum? Yeah, th now they're talking about, yeah, re- Re, uh, yeah, with the calcium appetite. Uh, um, you know, I don't know how that process works. Like, it, it, I don't know. I don't know enough. I know what I've read a little bit about, but I don't know enough how that works. If it's an acidic or basic. I mean, really, what you're doing is making an ion to stick back onto the, the enamel. Like, they're they're taking that calcium appetite stuff and it goes back, deposits back onto the tube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how that works. All right, we'll stop here. Uh, on so let me just I will email, I will put up on Blackboard where we are, where you should be. Um, on on Wednesday we don't have class on Monday. We're really about up to base solution. 
We are going to do some uh, ice tables with acids and bases. That's coming up for weak acids and bases, all right? So we'll pick up on that on Wednesday. Um, I'd go on and read most of the rest of the chapter, though. I want to try to finish this chapter in two so we're back in line with the syllabus. And I will post the uh, Master in Chemistry for 15 sometime today or tomorrow if you want to get started on it. Xylitol? Yeah, well, so that it doesn't use the sugar? It's like if you got two, you can't feed off of it. So it's, yeah, it's the sugar. It's sugar yeah, but that's the whole thing is that you use xylitol so that, like regular sugar bacteria starts to really multiply and starts eating off the enamel. Yeah. yeah, but this xylitol doesn't do that. Does that have anything to do with pH? Uh, no, I don't know. Is, is it? I don't know. That's what I don't see. So you're getting into the biology. When you. When the bacteria damages the tooth enamel, is that because it's generating an acid? Yeah, because the bacteria turns something. Yeah, it turns something into an acid. Yeah, it turns your food into an acid. Yeah. So that's so the reason you take xylitol, you chew gum with xylitol, is that doesn't cause the bacteria to grow. Yeah. I think this kind of stuff makes you think about the mouthwash. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the whole thing, if you want to build back, you know, like now they say, you know, if you lose your enamel, we can't replace it. But that's the whole thing. The new, we're hoping in the next five years, we got something you can actually build the enamel back on. Yeah, yeah it just hardens it. That's all. It protects it. It doesn't really. Yeah, we memorize it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, 9 30 to 11 30, and uh, Monday, 12 45 to 1 45. Okay. All right. I don't have any today. That's fine. Yeah. I'd like to come in one day. All right. Yes, sure. Okay. That works. Like, yep. Hey, can you pull that one over there? Which one? The front one this year. Oh, the first one on the on the master chemistry. I mean the inner the uh, the one on master chemistry. Well, let's go up to my office. Cause she's gonna be in here and she's gonna start class. Is it that fast? I don't know. I that real quick. I was gonna get glanced at. I think it's funny if nobody else asked about. It. Did you say see anything wrong with that uh, introductory one in master and chemistry? Well, the master in chemistry is the and it was one of the tutorial ones. Which one is it? Do you know what the number is? What are you? I don't know where oh, you're talking about. Um, you all got the same one. The only, the only, you got the same, everybody got the same question. Actually. You got different numbers to crank out, but you, you got the same question. It was one like, okay. There were two that like no one I knew could get. The last one. Are you going to no. another one? No, I, we worked, people came by my well, office yesterday and the day before. Well, even uh, Shane said he came by my office and said we all cranked out numbers and it wasn't right. Oh, it didn't work out for him? And so he couldn't, he was trying to explain it to me and I, the, I the deleted one of those one, one. The, one? the carbon graphite one? We worked yeah. out. I, did, yeah. I got every one right except this one. Because I even showed him how to do it. I know for yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you know what it was. But I mean, your office hours are never any time that I can be there, so that's a problem. Well, what's the what's the best ones for you? Um, let's see, Monday, Wednesday, between 9:15 and 11 a.m., and between now and 3:30. Yeah, well, you could do that on Monday. Now and now 3:30. So I've got office. I would, normally I have an office hour on Monday from 12:45. I mean, yeah, from 1:45 right now. Oh really? To 2:45. Yeah. So after class on Monday, you're free. Yeah. I mean, I can't do it Monday before class because I'm in class. I'm in over in the from 9 to 11 30. Oh. Well, so yeah. 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 so all interesting about teeth stuff the whole time and then make more sense to me. Yeah, but I've got to, I got to peel off the mask. I know. <laughs> I know, like in this, I'm like, okay, pH, I recognize well, Yeah, most people do too. Maybe yeah. well on this check, because they're all interested about pH. Yeah.
14, not so much. Oh, but that's the tool 14 feels to worse do. to me than 13. Oh, that's good. I mean, 14 right now. Well, I'm that's like good. That means I did a good job teaching kinetics. But most people don't like the kinetics stuff. Well, I'm going to 90, so I mean, that's me. About putting my computer through the wall. Yeah. On what? 14? Uh, yeah. This one, I'm so Oh, yeah. I mean, there was like six of them. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I know. There were two of them. I just left. And I was yeah, like, they're not, you know, like that one, it was, it was the hydrogen and carbon. That was a two, really, like doing it twice. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was like, it was, it was I'm just confused on what the heck I'm supposed to do with all that. When I, like, I'm like, I get all this information. I'm like, I know what I'm looking for now. How in the world do I get to it? Like, there's too many formulas and too well, many. Well, I felt like there wasn't, like, enough information there to figure the answer. Yeah, sure like, I don't know what to do with these numbers now. I was just so mad at last night, though. Oh, yeah, me too. I finally just said, well, forget it, and laid down the I mean, James and I asked for 15, huh? 20 minutes. I know. Oh, yeah. I was like, well, you can call me and try to explain. I don't know why he didn't get His number I still didn't know why he didn't. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't either, because that's the same thing I told Nick. Nick emailed me last yesterday and said, I'm stuck on that same problem. And I just, I, even, I didn't even write it out. I just typed it out and said, you need to do this, this, this. And he got it, so I don't know. Yeah, well, I still vote you need to give us some extra credit for just time that once in, once in a blue moon to help boost. I almost, you know, I just barely made that hay last year. I know, but that's not extra. <laughs> that just removes the bad, a couple bad ones. That, that's yeah. like extra. Oh. If I didn't remove them. I know. <laughs> kind of, yeah. And you got the curve, 85 per day. I know, and I last semester, what did I get, 85 point, like, 5? Like, I barely got it. Uh, of course, yeah, my first were, test. You were a little I, bit below that, actually. And oh, I that, was, uh, that was Michelle, wasn't it? Hers was like 84.6 or 84 point. I remember on mine, it was like I got an 88 and I had to have an 86 for the. I don't know. I, there was something that was just a little bit. Yeah, I, well, I know. We looked, when we looked on ours, I knew I calculated I had to have an 86 on the final to get an A and I got an 88. And then she got. She had to have an 82, she got like an 80. I think you still curved it up more. Yeah. If I'm remembering correctly, because she was like, oh my gosh, if I don't get that A, I'm going to be so good. But anyway. All right. Over to Cadillus now. All right. Bye. Either way. Are you finished? Are you finished for the day? No, I've got a class over today. So what are you taking over there? Uh, well, all my classes except this one. I've got, uh, I've actually seen the lab over there, which is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, I didn't even know. I really didn't know. It's a TA. They're not interested in doing anything. Well, that is like, <laughs> I'm kind of bleeding. Yeah. You know, we've done some other research on our team. So the first two experiments are over 11 and 12, so I just went to the PA or trying to figure out what was going on. Oh, yeah, that's true. They yeah. Yeah. We don't even yeah. cover it first. Because we kind of put a little pieces of it in, just not all of it, but little pieces in there. We were just talking about the other chapters. Yeah. And we, but we don't cover it. Yeah, well, we, did, yeah. we cover all them chapters, we lose a bunch of students. Because you have to go through them. You go through them in a week. I was in the final semester out there. I got an A in class. Oh, really? But I killed myself to get it. Who, who was your teacher? Um, no, I wish I had her. I actually had a new guy who was an Indian guy, which made it even worse. And it was in my class. I couldn't understand a word he was saying the whole time. So I had like teaching to myself. Basically. And point rooms really. Because she, she started here. Yeah, well, she, everybody. And she went over. So she knows how to structure so yeah. somebody can follow it. Well, that's, how, that's what everybody tries to get her. Like, you can't even get in her class. <laughs> if she, if she, if everybody finds out, like, which section she's teaching, everybody's on, just, like, trying to get it as fast as you can. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about that question. I know you want to carry off the right now. Yeah, yeah. We're going to that. Okay. But I was wondering what was going on. I don't see how Chad is doing that. 
<laughs> he's, he's, the, he's the great compromise. Yeah, he is. He, he's a he's he will compromise. He's a compromise. <laughs> So to see somebody yelling at Chad is like, I've never seen this since I've been here. Who was yelling at who? One of the students yelling at Chad in the lab there. Oh, just now? Just, yeah, just. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? She's yelling with anger? Yeah, she wouldn't have to. I don't know what it's about, but I. So let's, let's see. Let's look at yours first. Yeah, just check this out real quick. All right. What's that bottom part? Right? There's no way you can get a numerical answer. All right, so let's see here. It says a chemical reaction between X2 and Y2 processes XY. All compounds are in the gas state. The picture shown here represents equilibrium mixture. All right, calculate the equilibrium constant. All right, so you've got... Um, I just said it my expression because you can't calculate it. Can you? Did they give you this? What? Did no, you put, that, put in? that in? Why did you put that in like that? Because that's the only thing you can get with You should have to count the molecules. I know, but that's not, yeah, you just count them. But this isn't the right expression because it would just be, right? Um, it would be x2 plus y2 yields 2xy. So this would be squared and these would be x2 and y2, right? Wouldn't be the order right. you get. Then you plug those numbers because this is equilibrium, right? So you count those and plug those in there and you get your answer. No, you don't. You know? Yeah. Look. Um, uh, let's look at it. Let's write it. This represents the coefficients, doesn't it? No. Well, it no. It represents how many is at equilibrium. You still got to write your chemical. So you would raise the, the number of these to the, you would raise raise it as a power. No, no, a okay. No, 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 no. This, remember, okay, the, the chemical reaction is like a recipe, right? So what, tell me what's a chemical reaction that, if you want to balance a chemical reaction between X2, Y2, and XY, what does that look like? It's X2. X2, Y2, and then 2XY. All right. 2XY. All right. So your K is going to be X, um, Y raised to the second power over X2, Y2. All right. So then you go in here and you start counting. So uh, X2 is red. So you got one, two, three red ones. You put a three in there. And then one, two, three, yeah, five, six. Like you put a six there. All one, right. Three. And then up there you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. All right. Is that right? Let's see, so we have 7 over 3 over 6, so we should have a total of 16 things here. There's 4, there's 4, there's 4, and there's 5. So are you saying 49 divided by 18? Yeah, 49 divided by 18. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what mine was. 49 divided by 18. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what mine was. 49 divided by 18 equals... 49 divided by 18 equals... It's roughly 2 point something. 49 over 18, that's 2.72. 2.72. That's bullcrap. Is that right? Probably is. What's wrong with yeah, it? I just was, I wasn't thinking that. But these, these are the actual molecules. These are the concentrations in the brackets. And then these numbers, these powers, remember, are the coefficients. I don't, know. I, I, didn't, I don't know how that represents the concentration. Because even the example in the book okay. shows when it, when it has a, something like that in the book, it says it doesn't represent the concentrations. Well, but because it says right here, this picture shown here represents the equilibrium mixture. Mm -hmm. And yeah. remember what concentration is. It's moles per liter, but you can use Avogadro's number and break it down to individual moles. This is a conceptual problem. I just figured it would represent the coefficients. I thought, no way. How is that going to represent the concentration? Like, there's a concentration of each individual one of these. Like... Yeah, well, we don't we won't really worry about the constant, uh, really the concentration, because that whole box is the volume, right? So the thing about that problem is, is that the reason why that's important that the you written, it's just like when you cook something, right? The the recipe yeah, is no the, the, just, the, the recipe is what gives you that, right? Oh, there's no way that tells you. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Well, you know what I about, so that also tells me that most people have got that one. Whatever. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. They won't kill you. What is it? One point out of all those? Well, I mean, it's just... All right. So which... 
Oh, Which one do you want to see? That's a consensual. That's easier than the math. That's easier than the math problem. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll look and see how many. Like you, like you just said, that's the easiest problem on there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's one of the. It's one of the easiest.